get out here and do other things yet tonight. Okay, uh, my name is Brian Bowman. I'm the chair of Cape County Tea Party. Welcome tonight. Thank you for coming out to our regular Cape County Tea Party meeting, uh, along with the candidate forum for those who will be up for election on August 5th for the primaries. Uh, we've invited every contested race in the county from every party to come out to the event tonight. Uh, let's get started. If you would, uh, go ahead and stand up, and we'll start with the prayer led by uh, Mother Mary. <coughs> Father God, we call on you to bless this nation. Oh Lord, we, we seem to be going the wrong direction. Oh Lord, we just ask you not to take your blessing from us. We ask you to bless each of us. Guide and direct us that we need to do whatever is pleasing to you. Be with us this evening. May our words be worthy ones. And Father, we just ask you again to be with us in all that we do, that we need to give you glory. And in your precious name we pray. Amen. 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 And Jim Rush is going to lead to the pledge. Military veteran, you may render a hand salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you. You can be seated. We have a few things to go over with. Uh, we hit for, uh, for all of our meetings. Um, number one, we have several items on the back table, either for sale or for giveaway. There's a bunch of Missouri constitutions back there. If you don't have a Missouri constitution, those are for free. There's some other items up back there. There's some nice gads and flags back there, and, uh, and a few books that are up for sale. So please uh, look into that. I know the candidates brought a bunch of information. I believe is on a table of court back there. Is that correct, gentlemen? Uh, and uh, there's coffee and, and tea and so forth back there too. Uh, we've got a 50-50 drawing going on, so if you haven't got your 50-50 ticket and win big money at the end of the event, see the uh, young... I'll raise your hand. Raise your hand and the uh, lady in the red hair will come uh, give you a ticket if you want one. We are also in the midst of a gun raffle. I don't know if you saw the picture up, th up there, but it's a Mossberg 500 12-gauge shotgun. I believe it's got three barrels. Two. Two barrels? Okay. <laughs> well, we always overestimate. Uh, three barrels. Two barrels, and uh, it's, it's got some blue in it. A uh, nice shotgun. We're going to uh, finish selling those tickets and get that. Probably will be ready to be uh, auctioned or uh, chosen the winner at the next Cape County Tea Party meeting. You don't have to be there to win, but we sure would like to have it. Uh, sign up sheet. If you would like to be on the Cape County Tea Party email list and you're not already on it, you don't have to sign it up if you've already done it before. Uh, if you'd like to be on the list, please pass this uh, down and uh, get your name on the list. Just need your email and name, preferably phone number, so we can contact you one way or another. Uh, let's see. Somewhere around here we have a teapot. If you've uh, got a couple of bucks you can throw away, we, uh, <clears throat> this doesn't happen for free, so if you can uh, uh, add a couple of bucks to the kitty, we'd appreciate that and it'll start passing it around somewhere. Yeah, start in the back for a change. Okay, uh, Cape County Tea Party's been going since 2009, like most tea parties. And like most tea parties, there was a point where it kind of fell off the tracks and then was not going again. It had a resurgence in uh, September of 2011 on Constitution Day, September 17, 2011, and we've been going strong since. Uh, on a weekly basis, we have a steering committee. We are always looking for people to step up and take a leadership role in the, in the tea party. And anybody that is, is like-minded, come on out, and we'd uh, love to have you. The weekly meeting is at 6 o'clock on Thursdays, and uh, usually goes for a couple hours to get all these kind of things organized and all the other events and activities do, we do along with the missions. Uh, of course, we have our monthly meeting that's called Third Tuesday Tea Time, which is what we are at here. Most of the times we have a speaker. Next month's speaker is on smart meters. Uh, who's, who's, not, who's not heard of Agenda 21? Okay. Come on out next uh, the, was it August 19th? I think it is. Uh, come on out. You'll hear a little bit about Agenda 21, which is UN and do-gooders trying to control how we use our power and energy uh, to save the planet. And uh, the efforts they're going about doing that. We have a young lady going to speak to us about smart meters, and that's uh, the electric meter on your homes. Um, but we, we love to have you come to these meetings. But the real need is for what goes on between the meetings. We can come to this meeting every month for the rest of our lives 
and our country is going to fail. And what everybody needs to do in this room is get active and get involved between the meetings. We've been, for the past 237 years, we've been electing <coughs> new elected officials every two years at the federal level and various timing at the other levels, local, state, and federal levels. How's that worked out for us? Great, isn't it? Yeah. 17 trillion in debt rocks. If we keep doing that, the country's going to fail. We're on this train. We're going off the track. So it's time for us to do something different. If we want to change something, we've got to do something different. If we keep doing the same things over and over the same way, expecting a different result, we know what that is, right? The definition of insanity. So it's time to get active and get involved between the elections and obviously between these meetings. These meetings are great. We learn a lot at these meetings, but we need folks to get involved in moving, uh, moving between the elections. And, and along that line is a splinter group or a subgroup of Tea Party called No Mo Tax. And these folks are working hard to stop the two tax increases that are coming up on the ballot in August. How many people knew that we had two tax increases on the ballot? All right. Good. Well, you know it. How many, uh, if, if you are interested in helping stop those tax increases, these folks can sure use your help. They have a meeting tomorrow night at 6.30, and if you want to talk and be involved with that, uh, Linda, you mind if they see you at the end of the meeting? See Linda back there in the corner with the sunglasses on at the end of the meeting. <laughs> And, and uh, you can talk to her about what's, what's going on with no more tax. Uh, I don't, does anybody in here think they pay too little taxes? Think, anybody want to pay more? I mean, we can, we can start a tea party tax. That's kind of, tea tax is what started this whole mess, right? So, and if you're interested in one of those t-shirts with the guy with his pockets out, he's a great guy. We've got to give him a name one these days. And yeah, those are going to, we have a couple available here. And uh, we'll, we'll take some orders for some too. Okay? Uh, just kind of where we're at, our mission is to attract, educate, organize, and mobilize fellow, fellow citizens to secure public policy consistent with fiscal responsibility, founding principles, and constitutionally limited government under God. Tea Party really started from the debt, right? Started from the debt. On January 20th, 2001, does anybody know what that date was? The debt was five trillion seven hundred billion. That's when George Bush was in over. On 9-11, what do you think the debt was? Five trillion seven hundred billion. They've just barely gone up. On January 20th, 2009, after eight years, the debt was, what do you think? 10.6 trillion. <coughs> Going up pretty fast in eight years, right? What What was uh, January 1st, 2013? January 20th, 2013. The debt was, anybody know? $16.432 trillion. It's not going down, isn't it? Didn't a whole lot of people run on platforms of decreasing the debt and slowing down the spending? Doesn't seem like it's working too well. What's the debt today? Anybody got an idea? I'll look it up. I'm sorry? 18? Almost there. $17.525 trillion in debt today. $17.525 trillion. Are we going to pay that off before we die? No. So what does that mean we're doing to our kids? Enslaving. They're going to have to work for it. Forced labor, right? That's not something we should be doing to our kids. So that's why we're here. That's the bottom line of what we're trying to do. There's a lot of other things that need to be done to get there. We call them missions. And uh, we are working to get that done. <clears throat> uh, speaking of missions, one of the things many of the Tea Party members uh, have taken advantage of or taken part in is called the Center for Self-Governance. How many people in this room have taken a class with the Center for Self-Governance? Okay. I would like to see all your hands go up and at least take level one of this class. It's five levels of training. It's eight hours per day of training. It's a lot of information, but it will change the way you think about government change the way you think about your role in government and really set a fire behind you to get active and get things working in the right direction. Okay. <clears throat> it all kind of stems from Dr. Franklin when he came out of the Constitutional Convention. Remember that story? A woman came up to him, 
said, hey, Dr. Franklin, what have you given us? A monarchy, a republic? And he said, a republic, and you can keep it, right? Well, he was saying that to a woman in 1787. How was she supposed to keep the republic? She couldn't do what? Vote. Couldn't vote. Couldn't do what else? Own property. Couldn't own property and couldn't? Hold office. Couldn't run for office. Couldn't hold for office. So how was she supposed to do it? Mrs. Powell, how was she supposed to do it? This class trains Mrs. Powell's in how to keep the republic. And that's what this group has really started working and fighting for. Um, we've had a lot of successes with what we've done so far all across the nation. When you call Dave Bratz, anybody know who Dave Bratz is? He took out Eric Cantor in Virginia. The guy that took out Eric. When you call his office and say, hey, how did you do that? He says, contact the Center for Self-Governance. They'll train you how to do that. Okay? So I highly, highly, highly recommend you go to the Center for Self-Governance website, look it over, see what you think, consider taking that class. Brian, how many states are we in now? It's we are training in... 14 states just about ready to add 15 and 16. In a very short period of time, this thing has just exploded. Yeah, they came uh, and presented to us right after the election in 2012. We took our first class in January. We finished the fifth level by September. Had our graduation this year. And uh, it, it's, it's been a, a life-changing event. It's been fantastic. So I hope you will consider looking into that. Uh, we probably have some flyers for that back there, Anthony. Do we have some tenor, tenor Yes, we do. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's see, a few more things to cover. One thing we ask you to do, if you're not, well, I guess we ask everybody to do it, is to get involved between meetings, right? So how many people went to a meeting of an elected governing body this past month? How many people went to one? Well, if you were in it. <laughs> but if we want to influence what's going on from a perspective of smaller government and staying within the Constitution, we got to be there, right? And it's not going to do it by voting. It's not going to take care of it. We've been doing that for 230 whatever years, and it's not taking care of problems. So what we have here are the schedules of all the meetings between now and the next Cape County Tea Party meeting for you to put up on your refrigerator door, and we ask you to pick one of those meetings and go to it. Go to it, talk to people, get to know people there, start working on building your relationships because if you want to influence government the best way to do it is to have relationships with them right it's not standing outside with your tea party sign busting and yelling that's not going to get it done did it stop anything that was uh, coming down the pipe in 2009 2010 sure didn't okay <clears throat> so please i'll be asking you next month did you go to a, a meeting of elected body governing body okay what else do we want to have here? All right, uh, after the meeting tonight, uh, we uh, typically go to uh, Beepo Brady's. We invite you to come out for some fellowship and adult beverages at Beepo Brady's tonight, so hopefully you'll come out and do that. Yeah. Usually have a pretty good time. Uh, again, the NOMO tax meeting is tomorrow. They're working against mostly Prop 7, I'm sorry, Prop K and Amendment 7. Trying to stop those. And uh, we're working, if you are a second shift kind of person, yes ma'am? Where is that meeting tomorrow? It's at FGR Mechanical, 620 Commercial. By the old skating rink. Behind Rent 1, old skating right? Yes, it was the old skating rink. It was the old skating rink. Uh, let's see. And we are trying to start up an afternoon uh, Cape County Tea Party meeting, weekly meeting to help do some of the organizational stuff. The, uh, there was a lot of people that were, we used to have the, the organizational meeting in the afternoon, and then it got to where we had more daytime workers, so we moved it to the evening. But we'd like to invite the folks that are working second and third shifts that would like to take part in this to uh, come to an afternoon meeting. So if you're interested in doing that, come see me after the meeting, and we can uh, get, you, get you on the list to start having, start having that meeting. Okay, what else do I want to cover before we get rolling here? Yes, sir. Uh, one thing to mention is that uh, there are different types of tea parties all, all over the nation. This tea party here in Cape County does not endorse anybody. We never have, we never will. Uh, just the members, they will endorse their own candidates. But keep in mind, this tea party endorses no one. Zero. I just 
wanted to make that clear. Not only is there the NOAA task group, there's also a paper group, uh, people actively promoting education reform. If you are education minded, uh, working uh, to uh, make sure our students are, are learning properly or, or in learning both sides of the aisle, uh, that group is looking for members to work with them too. So we have, you know, basically the Tea Party, we have the NOAA task group, we have paper, we have some subgroups trying to do different kind of missions and so forth. If you're interested in getting involved with that, uh, Probably talk to Janet back there standing up. Okay. What else? Anything else we need to do? We get it all? Okay. Um, as you can see, I put the question up that we're going to ask all the candidates now. We're going to give them five minutes for the rigorous stump speech and then a minute to answer the question. Since we are Tea Party, we're asking this question up there tonight. I'm going to give you guys a copy of it to take out in the hallway with you. I don't know where this order came from, but this is how you ended up in my Word document when, I, when we started putting this together. So that's the order we're going to go in tonight. Everybody's here, right? So we'll just go in the order that was on there. We'll start with the Associate Judge, Circuit Judges, Division Three, uh, Jeffrey Dix and uh, Gary Camp. What else do we need to know? Uh, if you would, you know, especially if you're a, a quiet speaker, try to use the microphone. And uh, you'll have five minutes. Our timer is right here in the front row. He'll have a flip chart showing you what you want. Um, I, if I, I will give you, you've been looking at that question, but I'll give you a question for a minute or two to, uh, to think about it. There, Gary. <coughs> Who's first candidate? Well, see, Jeffrey will be going first, so Gary will be the one that's the All question right. first. Gary? Uh, right. yeah. He can remove the mind because it's not, if he doesn't want to hold the mind, he can just stand. Stay in here for a second, Gary, before we uh, send you out. Yeah. Uh, you guys won't pass this for the candidates. Okay, uh, what am I missing anything? So, five minutes to talk, or six minutes to talk, basically. Uh, five minutes for your rigorous speech, a minute to try to answer that question up there on the board, and you're going to copy of it now. Um, Pretty simple, right? We're going to sequester one group at a time, in and out. Easy to use, right? Any questions? Who's the second group to go? Second group to go is recorder of deeds. All right. Ready to go? All right, let's roll. Chase them out of here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, candidate for Associate Circuit Judge, Division Three, Jeffrey Dix. Good evening, I'm Jeff Dix, as he just said. I would uh, rather ask, answer questions, so if you have any questions on, what you're, on what's on your mind, please feel free to raise your hand and I will answer the questions. Uh, in terms of talking to you all, I think there's a couple things that you need to know about this race. Uh, one of the reasons why I'm in the race um, is because right now, in Division Three, speaking of government waste, there are 600 on average disqualifications of this judge right now every single year. What that does is the clerk has to process that. First of all, the clients pay more to their lawyers to disqualify the judge. The clerk has to process it, has to send it to the circuit judge, has to come back assigning a new judge, has to go back to the clerk and the computers, back to the attorneys. Then the new judge comes from Bollinger County or Perry County. Now those two judges aren't elected by us. They're handling 600 of our cases a year, and we have no say-so over them. We can't vote them out of office. We can't vote them in office because they're not in our county. Yet they're handling 600 cases a year that our judge is paid to hear. Why, why the disqualifications, generally? Well, and generally speaking, it's because how people are treated in that court. Yes. It has nothing to do with treat. It has nothing to do with convenience. It has to do, there were 600 when the, he had two dockets a week a couple years ago, still 600 disqualifications. Down to one docket now, still 600 disqualifications. And it's because of how he treats people. And that, it's that simple. Um, he treats the lawyer, lawyers poorly, he treats the defendants poorly, and I'm not talking about sentences. I'm talking about just talking down to people, belittling people, uh, making <coughs> people feel uh, less than human. I mean, I'm going door to door every day and people are giving me stories every single day about how they were talked down to on a speeding ticket. And I knew the stories. I've been getting rid of them myself all these years. But that's why. It's because it has nothing to do with convenience. 
was because people are treated very, very poorly there. He, he's demeaning, and quite frankly, I got tired of it. I just got tired of it. I'm 54 years old. I don't need to be going door to door in 100 degree heat index yesterday. But I'm doing it for the people at Cape Girardeau County. They're the ones being mistreated. I'm not a politician. Don't pretend to be a politician. I didn't go to the politicians for help. I didn't go for their support. I went to the people of Cape Girardeau County because they're the ones that are being mistreated in court. And like I said, I, I simply got tired of it. And to watch people go in there for a pro se divorce, every other judge in our circuit puts the lady will come in for a divorce, doing it herself, no lawyer. Every other judge will put that lady on the witness stand and ask her the questions. Some will even do the judgment for them if they don't know how. Not Division Three. They get, they get to me. I've had two women coming down to my office from the courthouse in Jackson to my office in Jackson still crying because of how they were treated in that court. Why don't you have a lawyer? You're, you Go ahead, ask your question. What? Ask your questions. What, what do you mean? Well, you ain't here trying to act as your own lawyer. Ask your questions. Call your first witness. They don't have a clue what's going on. Every other judge puts them on the stand and takes care of it for them. Not this one. I got tired of it. I sit there and I watch this stuff. And that's why. Nothing to do with convenience at all. Every other judge has weekly dockets. Scott Horman in Scott County has two weekly dockets. Nobody gets rid of him for convenience to get some other judge coming in once a month. And it's just not right. And it's not right that other judges from other counties are hearing our Cape County cases. You want your judge to be accountable for the cases he hears. And those judges aren't accountable to us. Fortunately, they're both very good judges. Now, a couple of the other things going on, and things that I would change personally, one of them is, He's the only judge in our circuit and the only judge I know of that allows people to keep drinking on first-time DWIs while they're on probation. That's not how you handle it, in my opinion. My opinion is probation is no drinking. You're in there for, for alcohol. You're on probation for alcohol. You have a condition of no alcohol. How do you handle it if they're drinking at home and have one beer as a probation violation? You don't revoke them. If they're drinking and driving, you revoke them. That's how you handle it. And that's the difference. Now, part of the other problem with having 600 disqualifications, there's two different systems of justice. Who gets rid of them the 600 times? All those who have the money to go hire a private attorney like that. They're the ones getting rid of them. I, would, I haven't done the numbers other than the 600, but I would guess 98% of them run in and get rid of them immediately, which leads to poor folks subject to Division Three. We have Judge Thompson and Judge Bullerdick handling the richer folks, and then you've got Division Three. Oh, I'm answering this one. Okay. Yeah, now you need to move to answering questions. Well, in terms of what can what can be done in that office, uh, there's not much. I mean, what has to be spent has to be spent. I'm not going to go in there if I'm elected and, and take forty thousand dollars of taxpayer money and remodel the office. Uh, and I'm not saying he did that. I, I don't have any idea what he did when he got elected. I'm not going to do that. I don't spend taxpayers' money for my own comfort or how the walls look or anything else. Uh, the other thing is you try to push more of the burden on the defendants, less on the county. Of course, the problem with that is, again, it's the richer folks who can afford to bear more of the burden, and the poorer folks can. Someone asked about home detention instead of jail. Well, if the county's paying for it, that's great. If the individuals are paying for it, not so great, because then the rich people get to sit home in their shackle while the poor people are sitting in jail because they can't pay for it. So again, thank you. Thank you, Joe. And he can stay, Joe, you can stand here if you want. Okay, you can answer the question first too if you want to answer the last. Could you please have them use the mic? Okay. Uh, Gary, come on up. Uh, Gary, uh, we had a, 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 a attendee ask if he could use the mic. Uh, so if you would, which mic? This the little one here. If you need to take it off there, go ahead if you want to. It's just fine. Whatever you feel comfortable with, all right? And I'll be your we'll timekeeper over here. Let me see what, how much time you have. Six minutes total, and one minute you'll answer the two questions in the final minute. And you can you can answer it in the first minute. It doesn't matter when you yeah. answer it. Yeah, if you want to go ahead and start with that, then I'll be sure over there. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, candidate for Associate Circuit Judge, Division Three, Gary Camp. Thank you. First of all, I'd 
I'd like to thank uh, the Tea Party uh, group for giving us all the opportunity to come and address you. And uh, your mission is, is a very important mission to the whole community. And so I, I do appreciate the offer and the ability to come in and, and visit with you. And I think I will jump in on the question first. Uh, you know, I've been in office for 20 years, and so I, I have instituted policies over the last 20 years that have had a significant physical and financial impact on uh, Cape Girardeau County. When I started office, uh, the average felony, uh, associate felony in the associate uh, division and, and misdemeanor took almost 96 days from start to finish to finish them. And over a period of a couple of years, we made procedural changes, we reorganized how we did business, and we got that down to approximately between 56 and 60 days, depending on how the cases go and everything. And you say, what does that mean? Well, if you talk to Sheriff Jordan and the County Commission, they'll tell you that every day they have a prisoner in the jail, it costs the taxpayers approximately $42 per person. So if we've knocked $30 or 30 days off of that, uh, that's a very significant fiscal uh, note for the Sheriff's Office, uh, the County, and, and you as taxpayers. Uh, I also, uh, during my tenure, uh, worked very closely with the legislature to uh, get instituted what was known as a crime reduction fund. And that was a fund that originally started by A.J. Sire, and an ethics commission kicked it out, and so we had to get legislative authority to start it again. Uh, the, the, the significance of that uh, doesn't have an impact on you, but any person in my division who's been adjudicated uh, guilty or found guilty by a jury, um, uh, we, we normally require them to make a contribution into that fund. So it doesn't come out of taxpayer dollars. We've bought police cars. We have funded deputy, uh, hired deputies, uh, bought sound recording equipment, and, and just made lots of improvements. And, and we, that fund probably raises anywhere from $100,000 to $150,000 per year, uh, depending on what happens. And, and there are no taxpayer dollars that are involved in that. Uh, another way that I have in, in my office, uh, I've always prided myself on how much money out of my budget I turn back to the county commission. And the first year I was in office, I told one of the judges who's no longer on the bench about that, and he wondered why I didn't spend my budget. I said, well, I didn't need anything, and, you know, I, I, I have no need to go through that. And we, we've done a lot of things over the years to watch our expenses because I, I feel I'm, I, I owe you as responsible as taxpayers uh, a, a good obligation to be a good steward of the funds that have been entrusted in me. And, and I pride myself as normally at least a percentage-wise, and I realize my budget is a very, very minute portion of the county budget overall, but it's still, uh, we've turned over a, a very a nice portion of our budget back every year. Uh, getting back into a little bit of background, Division Three is primarily a criminal division. It's not a family law court. It's not a civil division. It's a criminal court. We, in 20 years I've been in office, we've handled uh, over 80,000 traffic and criminal cases. Uh, I would estimate it's probably 90-92% of the work we do is criminal, so that, that's where we're at. Uh, I bring into this job uh, a lot of experience. I was a prosecutor for nine and a half years. I was a defense lawyer, criminal defense lawyer for seven years, and I've been uh, the criminal division uh, three uh, judge for 20 years. So I think I've got the wide range of experience. Uh, I brought in the, the integrity. I brought into the abilities to to come in and balance and, and see that not only did the criminal defendant uh, have rights, but the state has rights, the victims have rights, and we've done whatever we can do to see that we, we balance that. And, and I think my performance over the last 20 years, uh, I stand on it. I, I have no problem at all, I have no qualm at all running on the 20 year record that I that I have before, uh, before you. Uh, you know, I think I've been recognized by the Supreme Court uh, last month. Uh, they asked me to sit as a special judge on the St. Louis Court of Appeals and review. Uh, we had to review four decisions from other judges in the Eastern District, which is basically St. Louis down to Cape and over to Rollin around in, in the Eastern side. So uh, that was a very exciting experience. I've also been appointed by the Supreme Court to hold cases. Uh, been out to Branson, Kimberlin City, uh, Laclede, Lebanon, St. Louis County, and I've done most of the counties in southeast Missouri. So I bring into those experiences in there. I also bring into uh, my job, I, I feel the old obligation back to the community. And I've served as a commander of Post 158 American Legion. 
I've been very active in my church, St. Paul Church, and I have uh, been president of that congregation. I was very active when my children were younger. They're emancipated now during their activities and participating in coaching. And uh, the JCs, when they were still a very viable, uh, important civic organization, which Mr. Roche can grin a little bit because I think he was under me at one time. And, and uh, uh, you know, but it, it had a lot of leadership, and, and I think you owe it back to the community. And um, so I, I think I bring a wide range of skills. Uh, I'm married to my wife of uh, Gail for me 29 years um, in two months, and we have two children. My mother's still living. Uh, they, we've been. Uh, I'm a fifth generation Cape County, and so I have a lot of deep roots in this county. I'm the only candidate that was educated in Jackson, SEMO, and University of Missouri. And I see I've got 15 seconds left. I do appreciate your time. Um, I'm probably going to skip out after this if it doesn't offend anyone. I have a friend that was uh, need to go to the funeral home for him. So uh, I appreciate the opportunity to go first and appreciate your time. Thank you, Jim. Uh, we'll see if we can get talk to the chair of the county commission. All right. Uh, next group is recorder of deeds, and uh, Scott's going to go first. So, Drew, you're out of here. You're voted off the island. Is that going okay for everybody? Uh, you can try to use that. Oh, I'm good. My, my voice usually carries, so I'll, I'll I'll try and not blast everybody. If you're having trouble, just raise your hand. All right. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, candidate for recorder of deeds, Scott R. Clark. Thank you, Brian, and thank you all for being here. I am your current recorder of deeds. I currently work for you. Um, four years ago, I stood before you with a goal to embrace and enhance the technology that is offered in the recorder of deeds office, and I believe that we have done that. Um, we have offered new services. Four years ago, if you had looked on the county's website, you would not even know that we had a recorder of deeds office because it wasn't listed, there was no presence there. Before I was ever voted into office, a change was affected because that caused my opponent to actually throw up something. On January 1, I flipped the switch on brand new uh, website for us that has more information, more accessible. Uh, you can search records online now that was never there before. And we have added to the database. Um, this year alone we have added 12,000 marriage licenses all the way back to 1975. So if you got your marriage license in Cape County and it was uh, 1975 to the present, I can search that on the computer and print it for you uh, relatively fast. And so I'm very proud of those things. E-recording is something um, that I'm also very proud of. And if you're a lawyer or a title company or a banker, uh, it makes the speed of recording so much faster. If you're the everyday individual, you might think, well, how does that affect me? And here, this is how it affects you dramatically. Number one, when a title company goes to close on your uh, transaction, your real estate transaction, if they can do that faster and more efficient with my office, it will save you money in the long run because title fees go down, title expo the exposure gap goes down, therefore their title insurance goes down, therefore their risk goes down, therefore your title insurance policy goes down, therefore you save money. And that's very important um, to me because I look at any money that I can save them, hopefully they will pass those savings along to their customers. Same with the lawyers. We have had several situations where a beneficiary deed needed to be put on record. And, and if um, you've ever experienced a beneficiary's deed, you know that that must be put on record before it's valid. We have had cases where um, the attorney dropped it in our uh, drop box at 2.30. We recorded it was back at 3. The person actually passed away that evening. Had they had dropped it in the mail, we would have received it after that person was deceased. The deed would have been invalid. And that's the efficiency with e-recording. It can take five minutes, as little as five minutes. I don't think I've done one under five minutes, but we're trying our best. Uh, I'm very proud of the technology and the things that I've done in the office. To answer the question of the 12,000 marriage license, this is how much money I spent to do it. I only spent my time to do it. We have utilized equipment that the office already had. In fact, um, when I got there, we were paying $7,000 a year to pay somebody else to do something that I could do inside the office. 
that's an immediate savings um, that we have not paid in the last four years because I do that job. We don't pay somebody else to do that, and it's because of my skills and knowledge. I have a master's degree in public administration. I wrote my master's thesis on records management document retention. It is funner than it sounds, I promise you. Um, it really does fit me. The Recorder of Deeds Office does fit me. I have years of experience in managing people and managing uh, business relationships. And the Office of Recorder of Deeds is unique because it is an entity that produces revenue that pays for itself. You do not pay sales tax to fund my office. You do not pay property tax to fund my office. If you use the office, you pay user fees, and those fees operate the office. And so we have to make sure that we're not overspending. And so my budget of $300,000, while it is a spec of the $17 trillion, I look at that money very carefully about how it should be spent and making sure that we do not waste it where it doesn't need to be wasted. And if there's a function we can do in the office and not pay somebody else to do it, we do our best. I stand before you with a record of three years of embracing and enhancing technology and utilizing my skills and my knowledge over my lifetime to hopefully provide you with better service. I think we accomplished that. I'm proud of the work that we do. I, I have an excellent staff. I work with my staff. They work for me, but I work with them. And I, I think that's important. I work with other offices as well. We've made improvements in uh, between the assessor's office and my office that were not there before. It's uh, much better because they can look at information where before they would have to walk down the hall. Uh, one of the best things that we've done is I physically scanned in and loaded into the system over 2,000 subdivision plats. And you might ask yourself, well, why does that matter? It matters because now we have more options. It works better for the assessor's office to be able to pull that up on their computer, zoom in on that information, instead of having to pull out an old paper version. So I ask humbly um, for your support on the August ballot. I enjoy the job. I want to continue in the job. There are many, many more things that we have to do. And so I thank you for your time and thank you for being here this evening. County for 217 years. My earliest ancestor came here in 1797. My wife already had some ancestors living here at that time. Um, I've always been interested in history from an early age on. Uh, as a little kid, I'd go talk to my grandparents and ask about our ancestors, where they came from, uh, why'd they come here, what were their lives like, things like that. And just something always interested me. As I got older, uh, when I was 17, the County Archives Center opened up. And the archives has all the county records from the 1790s forward in one location, pretty much, except for the deeds, which are still across in the recorder's office. So I'd go over to the archives after I got, got out of school and, and research my family history. I'd go in there, you know, if I wanted to look at my great-great-great-grandparents' marriage license. I'd ask them, they'd go back, they'd pull it, I could look at it. Uh, the application, anything like that, any record in there, the vast majority, there's very few things that aren't public records. So I looked at did a lot of family history research, all the different types of records there. And then I'd also go over to the Recorder of Deeds office to, to research the deeds and uh, the property transfers to see what land my ancestors owned. It, it was very important to me. Uh, I'm expecting, my wife and I are, uh, a baby this month, or actually in August, about 20 days after the election. And she'll be 10th generation Cape County native. And at that level of her seventh great grandparents, which came here, you have 212 ancestors, or 512 rather, ancestors in that one generation. And that's an awful lot of people to, that, you know, and that doubles every generation. So you, there's a ton of people out there that all make up who you are. And so it's important, you know, in doing research to research every one of those. 
and they all leave behind a paper trail and there's a lot of records. So there, there's a whole lot to, to research when you're doing this and I spent most of my life doing that. After high school, I uh, graduated from Jackson and I went to SEMO, I was going to be a history teacher. And then I decided I didn't want to do that, I wanted to do something more along the lines of historic preservation and actually working with documents either being a professional genealogist or an archivist. Um, graduated from SEMO and the county hired me to be the assistant director of the Archive Center. I've been there since 2007 and I love that job, I really do. Uh, the first day I went to work, came home, told my wife that I was going to retire from there because I just, it was so interesting to me, I really enjoyed it. And the Archive Center, you know, our mission is to protect and preserve these county records for future generations so that you know our great 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 grandchildren can come in and research the same records that we're researching today but also to make these records readily accessible to the public people come in we pull the record they look at them and it's as simple as that almost everything in there is public record and that's why I'm running for a recorder of deeds office there's some issues with the recorder's office that I feel very strongly about um, just in January of this year, the current recorder closed off access to all marriage records housed in the Archive Center to people who come to the Archive Center and request those. We can no longer pull them. Um, since the Archive's been there in 2001, people come and ask, we pull them, and they could look at them and get a copy or whatever they wanted. And we can no longer do that. And it's very upsetting to have someone from out of state travel 500 or 1,000 miles and say, I want to look at my ancestor's marriage license and we can't go back and pull the original. Yeah, they can still obtain a copy of the marriage record from the recorder's office, but it's not the same thing. It's a, uh, there's two copies of it, and it's the less detailed version. They want the more detailed version that's housed in the archive. So that's why I'm running. Uh, just a year ago, my wife and I, we took a thousand mile trip, uh, left last July, and we hit um, courthouses in, in multiple states and multiple counties in each state. And for that very um, purpose of, of researching my family, looking through the deed records, the marriages, things like that. And I've never been denied access to any county record in any state in this country. And I think it's an embarrassment that that's happening in this county and I wanna change that. Um, that's, that's what motivated me to run for recorder of deeds. I uh, wanna provide better customer service to the citizens of this county, easier public access to all public records and hopefully, um, you know, do a, a much better job. Uh, getting into the, the monetary issue, uh, where the question's asked, there, there's only so much you can cut because you, you have to, to run, you know, the office efficiently. But the recorder's office uh, is kind of an exception to the others in the county in that it makes money for the county, and as opposed to other offices which are just funded by taxpayer money. So really, you know, the recorder's office doesn't have that much they can cut, but at the same time, you can cut a lot. I don't plan on going in there and remodeling the office. Uh, there was a heck of a remodel four years ago in that office. I don't know what the total cost was, but just guessing, I'd say it's $50,000. And, I, you know, if someone could go and look at a picture of the before and after, it would be a heck of a shock. I don't plan on doing that. The office is fine as is, and it was beforehand, even though it's been remodeled. You know, um, that's not an important thing to me. The important thing is providing easy customer service, um, easy access to all the public records, and to not not to not deny anybody access to any record that they have um, every reason to look at. Thank you all for coming. Okay, next on the docket here is the uh, Ward 3 City Council members for the City of Cape, and we start with Victor, so that means Evan, you're off the island. Temporarily. Temporarily off the island. <laughs> Have a good hike for you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, right. candidate for Ward 3 Council, City Council member of Cape Girardeau, Victor Gunn. Well, thank you for having me. I've been to the Tea Party meetings in the past, and I plan on coming in the future. Most of you uh, have 
see me around doing political campaigns and such because you're all active and when you're active you know what's going on and I like to know that when you're working for the public that you have a person who can do the things that are necessary to uh, get the job done and with the city council they're pretty much a uh, your voice for your ward the way it's set up in Cape Toronto and the issues that come before the city council generally are housekeeping in a lot of cases there's a lot of ordinances about planning and zoning and things that aren't real interesting to most people because uh, the council meetings I've been going to lately about the only people showing up have a vested interest in whatever is on the agenda and or Tea Party members. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself. I've got, uh, I'm a seventh generation Cape Girardeau person. My family's been here since the 1860s. We currently, due to the longevity of my great uncle, have five generations living in Cape Girardeau and Cape Girardeau County. So I have a vested interest also in Cape Girardeau. I was born here uh, and I have uh, retired here and I have been working for political candidates pretty much for the last several years. I, my former career was law enforcement. I had 24 years as a police officer. I retired as the deputy chief of police and actually the leader of that department because we didn't have a chief of police due to a city council uh, brouhaha over a fire chief and a police chief and uh, it was a lawsuit so there was a deputy fire chief and there was a deputy police chief and for the two and a half years before I retired we ran the departments. I sat in front of lots of city council meetings. I managed a multi-million dollar budget for the police department. I have a lot of experience with city government at that level. I have a background in education and law enforcement, but I observed many levels of activities in the community, and I was involved in a lot of them. Uh, several of the, uh, I was in the Rotary, and I was in the Lions, and I was uh, involved in uh, many things that a leader should have. To, and I uh, think all of those qualities, the experience, of uh, 24 years in law enforcement, an educational background in law enforcement. I also have a degree in history, so I mirror some of the comments of the people that have gone before me. The city council is your voice, and you, the government level at the city level is the first step where we get to this. these other uh, organizations. The city typically has to pick up your garbage, keep the streets clean and maintained, provide law enforcement and fire services. All of these things are desirable and they cost money. Therefore, there are taxes. I will ensure that those services will be provided at the maximum level but with fiscal responsibility. I question anything that comes before me. Does this, is this really necessary and do we need to pay for this at this level? I'm a fiscal conservative and I attend a local church, Bethany Baptist Church. I'm a Missouri National Guard veteran. I have lots of experiences to bring to the City Council and I ask for your vote and if you have any questions and I'd be happy to answer them in the future. So I appreciate your coming. Appreciate the Tea Party for having us because uh, this is actually the first forum that uh, myself and Evan have had 
And before I have enough time, I'd like to thank the other candidate and his wife. This has been a very uh, not stressful race. We've gotten along well, and I appreciate everything that they do. So thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. group this, this uh, meeting tomorrow at 6 30. See the uh, young lady in the back in the white uh, jacket. <coughs> Go ahead and get that adjusted where you want it. Sure. Yes, we know I'm short. Okay. I said it the nicest way I could. Thank you. Go right. How about that? Right. Ready? Candidate for Board three council members, City of Cape Girardeau, Evan Trump. Thank you. I'd uh, also like to thank the Tea Party for having us tonight. I think it's important. I've always believed in politi political education that uh, the best voters that go into the ballot box are the ones that are most educated. I'm ready for city council because I believe I have a servant's heart, and I believe that exactly is what a public official is, a servant. To those uh, who they represent, uh, whether it be House of Congress or City Council or the County Commission or what have you. I also believe in having a transparent and accountable government. That is something I believe is vitally important at all levels of different at all levels of government. Some of the issues that I believe are vital, that are important to me, if elected on City Council, is public safety, which means I uh, support a strong fire and. Um, strong fire department and a police force. And in order to accomplish this, one of the things we need to look at is also improving our retention rates among our officers. Instead of uh, Cape Girardeau becoming a training ground and having an officer here for two years and then being transferred off to a city that is either the same population or less and receiving better pay and benefits. Also, I believe our infrastructure is important to maintain our cities, and our streets and sidewalks need better attention with ongoing maintenance and repair. Doesn't mean I'm necessarily for bringing on new projects, but we have to maintain the ones that we have now. I think we have neglected that in the city, and I'd like to see us return to maintaining what we have. Being in business, as I have been, I also want to see that we continue to grow our local economy by having an environment that is friendly to the entrepreneur hanging out his or her shingle. We have opportunities both for this downtown and west part of Cape. Both are vitally important to the economic growth here, not just one or the other. I believe the experiences that I've had in my career and local politics gives me the readiness to serve the citizens in Ward 3 and Cape Girardeau on the City Council. Outside of my career in business, I was also elected in 2010 to serve as the chair of the Cape County Republican Central Committee, which gave me the great opportunity to work with some tremendous individuals to help organize and lead our 2012 Presidential Caucus here in Cape County, which I believe we held a very successful county caucus, unlike St. Charles, <coughs> and were able to conduct business accordingly. But my leadership skills and successes have not been because I believe I'm the best leader, but instead because I've had great people helping me and working to achieve our goals. I once was told that I don't have to be the smartest, room, the smartest person in the room, but I have to know how to identify those around me to be the smarter, smarter people to be able to uh, accomplish the goals we were set out to achieve. A uh, little bit of background about me. Uh, I was born in Eldorado Springs, Missouri, which is a little small town just west of Nevada, Missouri, which is in the western part. If you've ever been there, the water smells like sulfur. Uh, it's very, it's, un it's unusual um, uh, circumstance, I guess. Uh, I grew up in Jefferson City and in Columbia, Missouri, and how I ended up in Cape Girardeau is I decided to attend Southeast Missouri State University, and after thinking, believing, I uh, knew everything I, need, I needed to know, I decided to uh, enter the workforce. But in 2005, I went back as a part-time student while working full-time and raising a family, and graduated in 2010 with my bachelor's degree in business management and organizational leadership. 
Uh, 2004, I became involved in local politics uh, by helping a close friend with the state representative race. And same year, I also uh, met, I met a beautiful young woman. Uh, she's here tonight, my wife Lori. We both uh, met at the Republican tent um, in 2004, and now she's my better half. So We have a 15-year-old son, Keegan, who will be beginning his sophomore year at Cape Central next month. We also attend Cape Bible Chapel. We have been blessed to serve in many different uh, ministry opportunities, such as Benevolence Committee, Children's Ministries, and Discipleship. In answering this question, um, City Council, uh, what can the City Council do or someone on the City Council do to reduce the size of government and the spending? Well, I believe one of the things that we can do is looking at, as I said before, instead of taking different funds that we're using to repair or to build new projects such as streets and roads, we need to look at maintaining the ones that we have. Uh, we are in a climate, uh, the economic climate we have currently, I don't believe suits us to be looking at a bunch of new projects that, are getting, that, we, need, that we continue to fund where we're having to also maintain the, the old ones that we have currently. So we need to make sure we're maintaining the old ones now and taking care of those. If you, had a, if you had a car that worked, semi-worked, you would rather spend, to save money, you'd rather spend money on repairing that car instead of going out and just buying a new one and having that money plus spending that plus tied up in the old car that you need to repair as well. Um, also, I believe that we can look at doing uh, different things of privatization. The water park, I know it's great. A lot of people enjoy it and everything like that, but I believe that is also could be done at a can be done with a private business venture instead of looking at government to for those kinds of things. Um, I believe that um, city council could do a much better job as looking at what tax incentives can we give businesses to bring those kinds of things here. So I appreciate uh, your time and thank you again for having us. And if you live in Warwick, I appreciate your vote on August fifth. Thank you. Circuit Judges, Circuit 32, we'll start with Alan Moss, so Trey and Michael, if you would get off the island. Just as you need to, and then we'll just start. Okay, candidate for Circuit Judge, Circuit 32, Division 1, Alan Moss. I'd like to thank the Tea Party for having us here. It's an honor and privilege to be in front of you guys this evening. A little bit about my personal background. I've been married to Katie Moss, who I know most of you probably met, the shy and reserved Katie Moss. Uh, for 21 years, we've been, I've been a member of First Baptist Church of Jackson for 26 years. We have three children, uh, Thomas, age 15, Trey, who is a sophomore at Southeast Missouri State University. 19 and Courtney, uh, 24. She's a, a secretary at our law firm. I am a life member of the National Rifle Association. Uh, probably half of every 52 weekends I have a gun in my hand, either hunting or shooting or doing something of that nature. I'm a member of the Missouri Right to Life. Uh, I have conservative Christian values and conservative principles, and I will never deviate from those principles. Uh, this is the circuit court position. It's the highest uh, judicial position in the three counties. Uh, it's the highest trial court level in our system. Over half of the cases uh, deal with serious felony offenses. Uh, the judges are dealing with the most persistent, most dangerous offenders in the circuit court. Uh, I have 27 years of civil and criminal trial experience. Uh, all of that trial experience virtually has been in front of the circuit court judge that I plan to replace or hope to replace. I've also served as a prosecutor. I've dealt with crime victims. I've dealt with law enforcement. And I've dealt with some of these uh, more prevalent offenders. And I understand what uh, threat they pose to the community. Uh, in addition, I served as an assistant attorney general. Uh, I was appointed by Governor Ashcroft to serve as special prosecutor in several cases. Uh, my duties as Assistant Attorney General, I defended the state from cases, uh, saved taxpayer dollars, 
I also represented the state in cases involving sex offenders who were trying to get early uh, parole. I've served as a municipal judge for 16 years, handling over 20,000 cases. Uh, my court in, uh, as a municipal judge, we were the first, and I believe we're still the only one to use the electronic check or electronic monitor to relieve some pressure for nonviolent offenders uh, off of the jail. Uh, the view from the bench is much different than that of a lawyer. Uh, you can be an experienced trial lawyer. That may not necessarily qualify you to be a judge. Uh, as a judge, you're not an advocate. You're there to make sure that everybody is treated fairly and impartially uh, and that the, the rule of law is applied. I've also done some criminal defense work, uh, although we do not take every case that comes in the door. I've argued a case before the Missouri Supreme Court. I've held cases before the Missouri Court of Appeals, and I've also handled cases in federal court. Uh, my life experience is that I have raised uh, three children uh, through teenage years and into young adulthood. Uh, that's the most important challenge we have as parents and here, and it not only changes them, but it changes us over time. And in 20 years, that has changed me. I can, I can tell you, although my kids may not agree, I'm probably a lot more patient now than I was 20 years ago. Uh, I don't have little kids uh, that die Easter eggs appearing before me in court. I've got young adults and teenagers. And I have to understand the challenges that parents go through and that those young people go through in order to effectively deal with them. Uh, the, the, the difference in this race is experience and the level of experience. The other two candidates were fine gentlemen. I'm, I've got 27 years of civil and criminal trial experience compared to 8 and 10 years. Uh, I am the only candidate that has been a judge. I'm the only candidate who has ever prosecuted a criminal case. I am the only candidate who has seen all sides of the case as a defense attorney, a prosecutor, and as a judge. And I think that uniquely qualifies me uh, to serve as circuit judge in this situation. Uh, last, I've never in my life seen government intrude into our personal lives as deeply and frequently as I have now. Whether it be the right to pray, uh, decisions we make for our health care, or decisions we make in our personal life. And the circuit judge is the last line of defense for your constitutional rights. You know, we stand between you and government. And my job is to rule and interpret the law, not to write new law. If I find a law to be invalid, I ship it back to the legislature and they rewrite the law, not me. I wasn't elected to do that. Okay, answering the question now. Uh, I may be the old dog in this show, but I'm willing to learn some new tricks. Among other things, 25 to 30 percent of the people in the county jail are, are going to get probation. The state's going to recommend probation, but because of the bond policy we have now, they're just sitting there waiting on a court date. We need to have more frequent arraignment dates uh, for felony offenses and move them through the system faster. Uh, not in terms of shrinking government, but in terms of saving people money. Uh, the judges have these cattle call dockets where we go down once a month and the judge wants to know what's going on. Most of the time we tell them nothing is going on and that costs the clients money to do that. Uh, I want to wrap up and thank you all for having me here and I appreciate this opportunity. Okay, the next reminder will be that we have the uh, paper group, People Actively Promoting Education Reform. If you're interested in getting active in that group, subgroup of Tea Party, um, contact or get with Janet after the, after the uh, gathering here. Come on. Okay, candidate for circuit judge, circuit 32, division one, Michael Gardner. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for the Tea Party group for uh, inviting us. I'm, I'm honored to be here. 
just to tell you a little bit about my background, I grew up down in Kelso and I graduated high school here at Notre Dame where I met my wife Christy and we've been together ever since. We have three children and uh, we're members of St. Vincent de Paul Parish here in Cape. Uh, Christy wanted very much to be here but uh, she is attending the pro-life dinner in Jackson uh, this evening. I went to college and law school up at Mizzou and I worked really hard in law school. There were 180 students in my class and I graduated number two so I hope that tells you a little something about my work ethic. Uh, after graduating, I had the great privilege of clerking at the Missouri Supreme Court 10 years ago for Judge Stephen Limbaugh, Jr. Uh, and uh, when I was working with Judge Limbaugh, we worked together on the biggest cases in the state. We worked on cases where millions of dollars were in dispute. We worked on cases where the state of Missouri was attempting to terminate parental rights due to abuse or neglect. And we worked on multiple death penalty cases. And I'll never forget seeing the faces of those family members of the victims who were there at the courtroom in Jefferson City after all those years after the crime occurred, and they were still seeking justice. Uh, after finishing with Judge Dunbar, I joined my firm, which is called Osborne, Hine, Yates, and Murphy, and we're in Cape Girardeau. And basically what we do is handle circuit court level cases throughout southeast Missouri, cases just like what Judge Seiler and Judge Lewis handled. And, uh, during my time in private practice, I've had jury trials in state court, jury trials in federal court. I've argued before the Court of Appeals, and when I was 28, I got to argue my first case in front of the Missouri Supreme Court. So if you think I look young now, just imagine what those judges were thinking back then. I'm 35, by the way, and I would point out that some of the finest circuit judges we have had uh, took office in their early to mid-30s. Uh, now, uh, last year, uh, the Missouri Supreme Court appointed me to be one of the six attorneys in Missouri who were in charge of the bar exam. And we're also responsible for evaluating the character and the fitness of those seeking law licenses. A big part of that is in it's our responsibility to keep bad lawyers from other states from coming into Missouri. Just like everything else, there's a few bad apples in every bunch. And there are lawyers in other states who cause problems, who hurt people. And if they try to bounce around the country and come to Missouri, our job is to protect the citizens of Missouri and keep them out. Uh, the fact that the Supreme Court has entrusted me with that responsibility, I hope, tells you something about my professional reputation in this state. Um, people sometimes ask me, why are you running? Why do you want to give up a successful law practice uh, to be circuit judge? And the reason I'm running is simply this. I think I would be really good at it. During my years in private practice, I've had the experience of practicing before strong judges, and I've had the experience of practicing before weak judges in other areas from where we're at now. And uh, I, I know the experience of working hard for a client, coming up with a good persuasive argument where you know you're right on the law, and then the judge denies it and without clearly without having even read it. And that happens, and I can tell you it won't happen with me. Uh, I'm a conservative. You may have seen that word on my signs, but it's not just a label for me. It's who I am, and it's how I've lived my entire life. Many people around this area are very frustrated with what's going on in the country and, and some of the rulings that you see from judges around the country. And uh, I think that there is too much activism in our courts. There are too many judges who don't simply respect that the role of a judge is to apply the law as it's written rather than putting your personal opinions in place of what the law is. If you don't like what the law is, then you call your state representative or your state senator and you tell them, change the law. But we can't have judges, elected or appointed, who are going to ignore what the law is and twist and turn things around to reach the result that they desire. Um, there are some judges who are even so bold to say that they believe we have what they call a living constitution which means that when the Constitution uh, is involved in a case, it's to be interpreted in accordance with changing standards of an evolving society. This is a phrase that they use. They're very open about this. And I remember when Justice Scalia was here back in 2006, he talked about this, and he said, if, if that's what they're doing, then that means that there is no criteria. A Constitution has to mean what it says. And we only have a living Constitution in the sense that if we want to change it, then we go through the process of a constitutional amendment. We can't have nine unelected justices appointed for life terms who get to decide how we're evolving as a society. 
One other thing Justice Scalia said during that speech I'll never forget is that their interpretation assumes that societies only evolve and that they never rot. As that underscores just how dangerous it is to have judges in that position of power who are going to decide how we're going to evolve as a country. Now, uh, to answer the question, uh, I would just make two points. One, I would like to follow the tradition of Judge Seiler in having a very efficient docket. There is an award that is given out, and uh, our circuit has received that award for efficiency. I think that's important. The other thing is to be responsible in terms of requests and requesting the, the state body that governs the budget uh, about we don't need a bunch of bells and whistles and gadgets that, that we don't need. Uh, if you go to the federal courthouse, you'll see a lot of bells and whistles. And I'm not going to be an elected official who's going to try to maximize whatever budget I can get to have a bunch of cool toys to play with. The role is what's best for the people. So, in conclusion, I would ask for your vote on August the 5th. Thank you. Oh, you'd like another reminder while we're waiting. Okay. Uh, Kate County Tea Party weekly meetings. Come on up. I'm just filling time. Uh, our Thursday evenings at 6 o'clock. If you want to get more involved, we'd love to have you take part of that. Uh, is that a good height for you? Or you want to adjust that a little bit? I'll bring it down a little bit. Take your time. Okay. Candidate for Circuit Judge, Circuit 32, Division 1, Trey Bertrand. Hi. Thank you. Thanks for having all of us tonight. Uh, my three and four year old daughters asked what I was doing tonight and I told them I was speaking to the tea party and um, they don't quite understand. <laughs> uh, I, I think that if they were to come in right now, they wouldn't, uh, not that you guys are a disappointing group, but they would be a little disappointed. Um, <clears throat> this is a very informed group in politics. Um, you guys are very involved in politics. Some of you may have already made up your mind on some of the races in here today. I've never ran for office. By profession, I'm a lawyer. I want to be judge. This is what I have to do to do it. But in running, I've gained an appreciation for the people that are active in the party, which is many of you. Uh, I've enjoyed uh, uh, my campaign up to this point, uh, but I'll be happy when August 5th gets here as well, if you can imagine, if you've been in a campaign. I've enjoyed the church dinners and the banquets and the parades, and I've enjoyed meeting the people in all three counties. I'm a lifelong conservative Republican. I share many of the beliefs, uh, the same beliefs as you all do. I believe this is a land of opportunity, not entitlement. I'm extremely pro-life. Uh, my wife and I have an adopted daughter, and if, any, if there's any adopted, parent, adopted parents in here, you understand that that, uh, if anything, kind of emphasizes your pro-life stance a bit. This is a, an important time in Cape Perry and Bollinger County. Our circuit judge is retiring. Most of you know the importance of this position. The circuit judge um, is in charge in many respects of keeping our community safe, uh, in charge in many respects of making sure that businesses and families get a fair shake in civil matters. As you're aware, the circuit judge handles the, the large criminal matters, the felony matters, and the large civil matters, those matters over $25,000 in controversy. And because of the importance of the circuit judge, like I said, we have to get this right. Um, there are qualities that you must look for in the person that you want to choose as your circuit judge. Um, I'll be the first to say that uh, any of us uh, can do the job of circuit judge. We'll all learn how to do it. None of us have experience of being a circuit judge. There'll be a learning curve for any of us, but uh, any of us will learn how to do the job. It's the quality of, of the man behind the bench that you, that you need to focus on when placing your vote. I'm asked uh, many a times uh, what qualities I think are important in a circuit judge. People often tell me what qualities they feel are important in a circuit judge. And some of them are honesty, integrity, unquestioned character, common sense, legal knowledge, and a hard work ethic. Now let me tell you a few things about me that I hope you'll remember. I, <clears throat> I do possess the qualities that I've mentioned, honesty, integrity, unquestioned character, and common sense. But those aren't really qualities that I can sit up here and brag to you about that I possess. Those are qualities that you're best to talk to somebody who knows me, um, maybe know me for a long time, and I think that uh, you'll be reassured that I have those qualities. I, uh, I'm from Cape Girardeau. I graduated from Cape Central High School. I went to SEMO. While at SEMO, I got a bachelor's in economics, and I got a master's in business administration. Then I went off to the University of Tulsa for my law degree. I'm a partner at the 
law firm of Bradshaw, Steele, Cochran, and Barron's, and I've been there for nine years. My law practice is very diverse. I practice both civil law and criminal law. In civil law, I, uh, or in criminal law, I, I handle felony matters and misdemeanor matters. And in civil law, I handle uh, divorces, adoptions, uh, business transactions, and general civil litigation. Uh, I've tried cases of juries throughout Southeast Missouri. I've argued cases in both state court and federal court. And I've argued cases in front of the Missouri Court of Appeals. I have the relevant legal experience and legal knowledge to be a good circuit judge. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my work ethic. That's another quality that people often uh, talk about, ask me about. I've worked hard my entire life. I got my first job when I was 16 years old at Hamburger Express over on William Street. Many of you have probably seen it. While I was in high school, I became the night manager. Um, worked part-time while I was in high school. Afterwards, I went off to uh, Alaska for a couple of summers and I logged timber up in Alaska. I came back, I went to uh, SEMO. While at SEMO, I got a job at Primetime Rentals, worked my way through college, I worked full-time. I became the manager of Primetime Rentals and I was the first in my family to graduate college. Now, working at Primetime Rentals and logging timber and flipping hamburgers doesn't qualify me to be circuit judge. That's not what I'm getting at. But what that does do is it gives you some real life experiences and an appreciation for people of all demographics that will be invaluable when I'm up there making life decisions for uh, people and families and businesses. I, uh, I believe you have to work hard in life to get ahead and nothing should be handed to you. My hard work ethic will carry over to the bench if I'm fortunate enough to be circuit judge. I was the first to announce that I was going to run. There was a couple week time period there where nobody else had announced and I had people often ask me, do you think somebody will run against you? And I said, well, I hope they do. I think that the uh, position of circuit judge is something you should earn and shouldn't be handed to you. All three of us have worked hard and I'll say that whichever one of us is fortunate enough to get circuit judge, they, they did in fact earn it. I am married to Rachel, Rachel's sitting right here. We have uh, three daughters, Laura, Camille, and Stella, and we're members of LaCroix United Methodist Church. My entire family is from Cape. I have a vested interest in the community. Uh, I'm asking for your vote on August 5th. Um, I've been very involved in the community. Some of the things that I've been involved in real quick, I'm running out of time, are Cape Girardeau Planning and Zoning Board. I've been there for eight years. Cape Chamber of Commerce, Jackson Chamber of Commerce, United Way Board Member, Old Town Cape, Timo Pachyderms, KJCs. I was president for three years, um, and it's the largest JCs in the state, by the way. A lot of people don't know that. Uh, and now, I, can I answer the question? Am I out of time for that? I'll, okay, I'll, just briefly, I'm extremely fiscally conservative. My wife says I'm tight, but I say it's fiscally conservative. There are some things that can be done uh, to, to save some money in the judiciary. I would say maybe an extra law day, uh, some rehabilitation, things of that nature, and I assure you that I do everything that I could in that regard. Thank you. Thank you. All right, yeah, another round of applause for all our candidates. And for all our candidates. Just a few more things to clean up here. Uh, we have a, you guys have heard of Heritage? Heritage.org. Uh, um, we have a friend of ours uh, from Heritage Action. You've heard of the Heritage Action Scorecard that keeps track of how well our uh, elected officials are doing. Uh, ben Evans with Heritage Action is here. He'd just like to say a couple words to you. How you folks doing? Uh, uh, so I hope that all these candidates here, uh, when they're in office, you do hold them accountable. That's the, that's the mission of Heritage Action. We're the political arm of the Heritage Foundation. I'm just going to tell you about a couple votes that are going on and, and policies that are going on in D.C. Uh, that you should talk with your Congressman Jason Smith about uh, and your Senator Roy Blunt. The first is on the, uh, the Highway Trust Fund bill that just got voted on today. Uh, this was a bailout of the highway fund. Basically what the federal government has been doing is they've been pushing money to uh, public transit, to flowers on the side of the highway, uh, to bike paths instead of spending money on highways. And that's why the Highway Trust Fund is running out of money. Uh, the feds keep throwing this money around all over the place. They just voted for $10 billion to fill up the Highway Trust Fund. I guarantee you that's going to be gone again in a few years, and they're going to be asking us for more money, kind of like what they're doing in Missouri right now with the 1% transportation sales tax hike. Uh, at the same time, we're pushing a bill. So our, our entire Missouri delegation voted for that, by the way, uh, the House, the Senate. It goes to the Senate next. So your Congressman Jason Smith did vote for that bailout of the Highway Trust Fund. 
Uh, the bill that we're pushing for right now is the Transportation Empowerment Act. This would allow Missouri to keep its federal gas tax and would even allow us to cut federal gas tax so that our fuel at the pump would be less money and we'd have the money to maintain the highways the way that we should. Uh, right now, the, uh, and even according to the U.S. Department of Transportation, the states own the highway systems. The states own the interstate system and they're in charge of maintaining that system. The federal government only really provides funds for about 7% of that. What the Transportation Empowerment Act does is it says the money that's collected on the federal gas tax is not sent to D.C. where they take this money out, spend it on bypass and flowers. It's, it's kept in the state. The state's responsible for spending that money on highways, and we can hold our state legislature accountable uh, much easier than we could our congressmen in D.C. So this is something we're pushing. The only congressman in the state who sponsored that bill right now is Billy Long in the south, southwest corner of the state. We're encouraging the rest of our members across the state, including Jason Smith, uh, to support that legislation. Uh, the only other thing I want to mention is on the Export-Import Bank. This is, this is one of those things where Republicans have to uh, start being the party of free markets and not the party of business. That is sort of uh, an image that is not doing as well as a party and not bringing in new voters and, and, and pushing out conservative principles. The Export-Import Bank is a, a bank where uh, the feds pick winners and losers and, and, the, and the corporate sector as far as trade is concerned. Uh, right now, it's pretty much Boeing is the only entity that really uses it. And our congressmen are telling us to sell small businesses and, and families out in trade. I, I, I wonder why they think Boeing is a small business because they're almost the entire amount of money that the Export and Import Bank is using. Uh, and, and Boeing themselves have said they can secure this financing for trade in the private sector. Uh, so it's just one more of those government programs that we can sort of get rid of uh, to reduce the size of government and to get power back in the hands of us as individual citizens. Uh, so I'd encourage you all to look at that. HeritageAction.com is the website. I'm Ben Evans. I'm the regional coordinator. I cover Missouri, Arkansas, Southern Illinois, and Eastern Kansas. Um, so I'd encourage you to look at those transport, that Transportation Empowerment Act, encourage Jason Smith to support that bill, uh, and take a look at the Highway Trust Fund and basically the bailout that Congress just voted for today and talk to uh, Senator Blunt about not supporting that, that bailout. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Okay, uh, we finished a round of sign-up sheet earlier. Did anybody not get that that wanted it? For anybody that wants to be on the email list, if you're not already on the email list, if you're already on the email list, you don't need to do nothing. A uh, reminder, we have gun raffle tickets back there uh, for the Mossberg 500. Uh, we are heading over to Beefo Brady's after we're done here. We've got a few of these Nomo Tax t-shirts as vote like your wallet depends on it. And uh, we ask you to get it. Because it does. Because it does, yes. Uh, proposition Amendment 7 is the sales tax increase. And uh, Prop K is going to take some of your money and give it to an unelected board to dole out to whatever they want to do to strengthen families. Uh, we certainly believe in strength, strong families, but money from me and you may not do that. Um, let's see, T-shirt. We are getting ready to fire up some radio ads. The Nomo Tax Group is. You got a few bucks you can throw their way on their website, nomotax.org, and uh, and help them uh, get some radio ads before the election on August fifth. Uh, all the new folks that are here tonight, thank you for coming. We appreciate you coming out and, and uh, being a part of this tonight. I think it was a great event. Hey, we got some t-shirts we can give away if you want to take a couple minutes to do that. I'll ask you some constitution questions. See if you're up on your constitution. Want to do a couple t-shirts real quick? Alright, so somebody answer this one. <clears throat> what was the first state to ratify the constitution? Delaware. Delaware. Give that man a t-shirt. <laughs> You'll be a member of the uh, Cape County Tea Party Dunk Tank Synchronized swim team. <laughs> How many words are in the Constitution? 279. 279. How many? 272. 272. Are you counting the amendments or the Constitution? Uh, whichever one you want. <laughs> okay, no answers. Eh? 4,400 words in the original Constitution, 4543 with the signers, and 7591 with all the amendments. Uh, what state is spelled incorrectly in the Constitution? Nobody? You could guess of one of the 13, right? <laughs> quick, quick, quick. Uh, Pennsylvania. I spelled it with uh, one N. How many days did it take to frame the Constitution? 
One hundred days. Wow. Uh, who was the oldest person at the convention? The oldest delegate at the convention. Who? Give that man a T-shirt. Which one? He had his hand up. Raise your hand. I gave him. Oh, I didn't hear him over there. Final decision. I'm the judge for the day. Uh, let's see. Um, what was the? Uh, how many rights are confirmed in the First Amendment? How many rights are confirmed in the First Amendment? Six. Three. Three. Rocher's got it right there. <laughs> yeah. What was it? <laughs> Say it out loud. Five. Yeah. Five. Okay. Good job, Jim. No, I just saw you saying it. <laughs> What's that? Small. Uh, small. <laughs> Two extra large. <laughs> Where are they, Jim? All right. What is the longest possible time a person can now serve as president? What is the longest time a person could possibly serve as president? Ten years. Ten years. Ten years. Very good. Give that man a t-shirt. What's that? Extra large. Which position has the longest term of office in the federal government aside from the federal judges? That's a judge. Aside from the judges, who has the longest term? The, the Comptroller General has a 15-year term. All right, final question. Who was the only delegate to attend every meeting of the Constitutional Convention? Who said that? There you go, give that man a t-shirt. What size, sir? What size? Large. All right. And one final piece of business, uh, the 50-50 drawing. So get your tickets out and we'll draw the 50-50. Let's see, how much do we win? One more We're getting two more tickets. Oh, we're selling more. You haven't got a 50-50 ticket? Anybody want a ticket that does not have it? Go on the bridge. Oh, still selling more. Are there any other announcements that I missed? Hey, they're interested in education. Linda, Linda, can you stand up? If you're interested in the Nobo Tax Group, Linda back there with her hand up. Education, yeah, over here. Please consider getting more involved. Uh, Heritage, get uh, Ben back there. All right, we ready? Not quite. Reminder, we're going over to people. Brady's next. Don't pay. Are you buying, Brian? Winners buying? No, the candidates are buying. The candidates are buying. <laughs> buying votes. We're going to find an honest man in here, a politician. Oh, <laughs> lawyers? Well, if we're smart, none of the butts will draw. <laughs> Go ahead and draw. Yeah. Go ahead. Reach in there and get one. Be sure to get yours. Yeah. Shh. All right. All right. Let those tickets. All right, last four numbers, four, two, four, six. This <laughs> five, four, two, four, four six. Two, four, six, check your tables. <laughs> it's me. <laughs> All right, if you would, stick around and help clean up. Uh, we leave this, this tea party, we leave this thing clean as a whistle. Uh, otherwise, we'll see you over at Beagle Brady's. Thank you for coming very much.